Welcome to virtual worship at Trinity Lutheran Church. This is the worship service for Sunday, May 7th, 2023. On May 21st, right after the nine o'clock worship service, we will be gathering for a congregation meeting. And at that congregation meeting, we'll, we will be electing a vice president, a secretary, an assistant treasurer, and a council member, people to serve in leadership positions here in our congregation. So be great if you could be come out and be part of that. Also at that meeting, I will be giving a report on the mini sabbatical that uh, that I took over the past year or so. You, know, you may recall last year in the fall, I had the opportunity to travel to Assisi and go on a retreat in Assisi and learn about the spirituality of St. Francis and St. Clair. And then later uh, in that summer, I had the opportunity to go to Star Island for a sitting and walking meditation retreat. And uh, most recently, I was on retreat with a bunch of my friends from high school. We did a bunch of um, nature walks and mindful encounters with nature while we were in the beautiful country of North Central Pennsylvania. And so I learned some things about connecting with God through nature, and I'd like to tell you about the trips that I took and the things that I learned. So we'll be doing that as part of the congregation meeting on May 21st. And there will be some nice pictures of Assisi and Star Island and even uh, north, north central Pennsylvania as, as part of the presentation. On May 20th, the Saturday before that, if you would like to participate in one of these Encountering God Through Nature walks, We'll be doing that. We'll be meeting at Trinity at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and then we'll drive a little ways to a place where we could take a nice walk. Not long, you know, maybe about 45 minutes or so. Not strenuous. This is not meant to be a strenuous hike. It's meant to be a mindful, relaxing encounter with the good creation that God made and to see glimpses of the Creator through that creation. So you're welcome to join us for that if you would like to do that as well. The Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The first reading is from Genesis chapter 4. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Word of God, word of life. The Holy Gospel comes among us in the words of St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay 
his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. We are continuing our series on the questions that Jesus answered. And we might wish that Jesus did not answer this question, or at least that he did not answer this question in this way. This is pretty direct. It's pretty direct, but it's also clearly not meant to be taken literally. I mean, let's, let's take a look at this. Peter comes to Jesus and asks, how many times do I have to forgive someone in the church community, someone who's connected with me? How many times do I have to forgive them? And he says, what about seven? I think seven would be really generous, Jesus. And Peter's, you know, Peter's feeling like that's quite a bit, you know, he's not one or two or even three, seven. And Peter might be being particularly clever here because as some of you might remember in, in the Bible, seven is the number that represents completeness or the number that represents perfection. And so Peter might be saying, how about seven, Jesus? That's the number of completeness. That's, that's pretty generous. It's pretty good. And Jesus kind of says to Peter, Peter, you're, you're, really, you're really not getting it. You're really not getting it. It's not about counting. It's not about keeping score. You know, Jesus says, not seven, but 77. And like I said, Jesus does not mean for us to take him literally here. Jesus does not expect us to have little notebooks where we write down, okay, Joe, I had to forgive him eight times. Okay, nine times up. 76, 77, nope, Joe, you're totally out of forgiveness. At 78, you're cut off. Clearly, Jesus is not suggesting that. When he says to Peter, not seven, but 77, he's saying, Peter, you, you can't count. That's not what it's about. That's not what forgiveness is about. That is especially not what God's forgiveness is about. God's forgiveness is unlimited. There are no limitations on God's forgiveness. And so then Jesus tells a story to illustrate this point. So, so there's, a, there's a king, Jesus says. And this king has slaves that work for him and that owe him money. And there's this one slave that owes him 10,000 talents. Now, when the people who first heard this story would hear 10,000 talents, that would be a totally, totally ridiculous number. It would be, you know, it would be like somebody said, oh, and there was this guy that owed the government $100 trillion dollars. You know, okay, the, the, the total debt of the United States right now is about $7 trillion. So $100 trillion is what somebody owes. Well, it's, it's ridiculous. It's absurd. And that's what, that's what 10,000 talents is. It is completely ridiculous. It is the equivalent of 100 million days of wages. Yeah, a hundred million days of wages. That's going to be a long time to work that one off. So it's the, the entire economy of, of Judea at that time produced about 600 talents. So 10,000 talents. It's, it's, it's a totally ridiculous, absurd money. It's way more. It's not even just a few times more, but, you know, more than a hundred times, or more than, more, than, more than 10 times more, the whole production of the whole country in a year. It's ridiculous. And Jesus means for us to see this 
to see for the people that he tells this to and for us to see this as something ridiculous. It is, there is no way that this guy could pay this back unless he's going to be working for a hundred million days. A hundred million days. That's a long time. A hundred million days is a long time. So there's no way he could pay this back. And so the, the first solution that's offered here, where it's, the king says, okay, so I'm going to sell you. I'm going to sell your whole family. I'm going to sell all your possessions so that we can satisfy this debt. Well, the most expensive slave ever would not come even close to paying a tiny, tiny percentage. You know, according to the records, you know, slaves did not go for that much money. Maybe the, maybe the most expensive slave in the history of the Roman Empire would be one talent. And this guy owed 10,000. So this is not a solution, right? And everybody knows this is not a solution. It's like, it's pointless. It's pointless. There's no way that this debt could be paid off. Yeah, sure. Sell the guy and his whole family into slavery. Sell everything that he owns. It's going to be a pittance. It's not, a, you know, it's going to be a tenth of a percent of what he owes, if that. So there's no way he's getting out of this. There's no way he's working his way out of this. There's no way that, that compensation can ever be made. And so he begs the king for mercy. But it's funny the way that he does it, right? He says, have patience with me and I'll repay what I owe. And everybody knows that's, that's a big lie. That's impossible. It's never going to happen. And the king knows that it's never going to happen. And maybe it kind of jogs the king's awareness to, you know, yeah, I mean, I could sell this guy and his whole family, but it's not going to make a dent in this debt. It, re it, it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. But what the king can do is just forgive the entire debt. Just say, you know what? It's forgiven. It's gone. You're okay. And that's an image. I think Jesus means for that to be an image for the way that God works with us. That no matter what we've done in our lives, no matter what our sins are, what our betrayals are, what our you know, what our struggles are, that those are forgiven. That God, that God does forgive and, and draw us back into relationship. But that's what God does. The problem is, is that we have an awfully hard time really accepting that. We have an awfully hard time realizing that God does not operate the way the world operates, right? In this system, in this story, well, the proper thing to do, the thing that would happen in the system is you can't pay your debt, fine. You're going to get sold, you and your family and everything. And well, whatever portion of the debt that makes up for, well, we'll just take a loss, but that's the way it's going to work. But the king says, no, that's not the system we're working here. Not doing it. That's not the system we're working. We are going to forgive this debt. We are going to make a fresh start. That's what God does for us. And yet it can be so hard to accept. Just like for the, for the guy in this story. It's hard for him to accept it. I mean, he's happy that he's forgiven, right? He's happy that he and his family aren't getting sold into slavery, but does he really internalize that, you know what, we don't operate under this debt system anymore? See, I don't think he gets it. And the reason I don't think he gets it is because he turns around and he sees somebody that owes him a hundred denarii or a hundred days wages. Okay, can you see, can you see the difference here? He was just forgiven a debt of a hundred million days wages. And this other slave owes him a hundred days wages. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, a hundred days wages, that's not inconsequential, right? That's not nothing. That's not like a dollar, right? It's a hundred days wages. That's, that's substantial. That's 
almost a third of a year of work. I mean, think about what that is for you. It's not inconsequential. And then the slave that owes the money here to the first slave whose debt was forgiven, you notice he says the same thing. Have patience with me and I'll pay you. Of course, the irony is, is that that might well be true. That might well be true. That's a significant debt. It's going to be a lot of work to work your way out from under that debt. But it's doable, right? We can work our way out of a third of a year's salary of debt. That happens. It happens all the time. So he could do it. It is possible. And yet the first slave, the first slave who was forgiven this enormous, incredible, insurmountable debt. See, he really doesn't believe it. He really hasn't internalized that this, this debt system isn't in place anymore. That forgiveness is the rule of the day. He hasn't internalized it. So he's, you know, maybe he's still worried that at some point he's going to have to start paying back. And so he better get his hands on everything that he can so he can pay back at least a little bit and maybe take a little pressure off. See, I don't think he's really internalized that he's been forgiven that debt. And so he's looking to get it back from other people. He doesn't believe. He doesn't believe in forgiveness. And so he says, oh, you can't pay? Well, man... I am going to use the same broken system. So I'm going to throw you into debtor's prison until you pay it back. Well, gee, that's a brilliant move, isn't it? Because obviously people make a lot of money in prison and will definitely be able to work really hard, really fast to pay it off. Yes, that was sarcasm. It's crazy. It's a crazy system. But this first slave, who was forgiven so much, can't see can't see that the crazy system has, has been suspended, right? That the king has decided, nope, that's not the way we're going to operate anymore. And see, I think that that's part of what Jesus is trying to teach us, that this whole system of grudge holding, this whole system of vengeance is, is gone because Jesus has come into the world. I think that's why he says 77, because you might, you, might, you might notice that that echoes the passage from Genesis, right? That, that Lamech says, if Cain was avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech will be avenged 77-fold. And he, he says he killed a young man for striking him, that the vengeance was overwhelming. The payback was completely out of proportion to the offense. Right, that that is the downward spiral of Genesis. That is the downward spiral of our world, right? More and more violence, more and more distress, less and less forgiveness, more and more vengeance. And Genesis is telling us, well, that's the way that it's going. And Jesus says, that is being reversed. That is being reversed. It's not 77-fold vengeance. It's 77-fold forgiveness. That's the, way, that's the way the kingdom of God operates. That's the way that the children of God operate. See, when we, when we are able to internalize that incredible gift of forgiveness that God gives us, that when we're able to realize that there really is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. That there's nothing that God cannot forgive. That there are, there's no barrier to reconciliation with God that God not only cannot overcome, but that God has not overcome. Because God has already overcome all those barriers. See, and I think the thing is, is this story points out how hard it is for that first slave, even though he experiences extravagant mercy, 
It's so hard for him to pass that mercy on. And again, I think it's because he's not really sure that it's real. But brothers and sisters, we can believe that that mercy is real. We can believe that that forgiveness, that, that incredible forgiveness is real. And that God not only offers it to us to bring us back into relationship with, with God, but that God offers it to us so that we can pass it on, that we can pass it on to other people, that we can heal or at least potentially heal the relationships, right? Because forgiveness isn't, forgiveness doesn't magically make someone ready for reconciliation. We know that. I mean, clearly this story teaches that, right? This story teaches that just because one has experienced incredible forgiveness does not mean that one automatically, instantly becomes more forgiving. I think it's a process. But see, I think whatever God commands, God also promises to empower us to be able to do. Uh, Frank Viola said that. Now, whatever God commands, God also promises to empower us to be able to do it. I think that's, I think that's, a, I think that's true. That God doesn't just command us to do things that we can never do. He may command us to do things that we can't do under our own strength, that we can't do just on our own power. But whatever God commands, God gives us grace to be able to accomplish. And I think when we receive that gift of forgiveness, it is a transformative gift. I was, when I was reading earlier this week, uh, Nathan Jennings, who writes for a commentary called Feasting on the Gospels, he suggests that this text demands that we forgive others and that we forgive ourselves. It demands not simply that Jesus' disciples be forgiving people, but that, we, but that we're a community of forgiveness, right? That we, we embrace forgiveness as an aspect of who we are as God's people. The deeper demand of the text is to forgive others as God has forgiven us. That that's a natural outflowing of the acceptance of God's forgiveness. And he says, without that performance, how can we enjoy the gift that we have been given? Enjoying a gift as truly gift means sharing that gift with others. And that's where that first slave doesn't get it. He doesn't get that as he accepts that forgiveness, that will empower him to pass that forgiveness on to others. He doesn't realize it yet. But the hope is that he may realize it. And the prayer is that we may realize it too. That as we have been forgiven, so God may empower us to forgive. Thanks be to God. Well, I can't believe what she said. I can't believe what he did. Oh, don't they know it's wrong? Don't they know it's wrong? Maybe there's something I missed. How could they treat me like
United in the hope and joy of the resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. The prayer response today is, your mercy is great. God of life, strengthen your church to proclaim your gospel, even in times of trouble. As we remember Stephen, we give thanks for diaconal ministry. Bless all deacons and strengthen them for their bridge-building ministry between church and world. Hear us, O God. Creating God, you show your steadfast love through mighty waters, towering mountains, verdant fields, and deserts. Protect the Earth's diverse habitats from the forces of pollution, erosion, extinction, and global warming. Hear us, O God. Mighty God, your spirit guides us into all truth. Give wisdom to world and local leaders and organizations as they begin, build, or renew relationships. Strengthen leaders and aid organizations in areas needing to be rebuilt following conflict, unrest, or natural disaster. We especially pray for people in Ukraine, Yemen, Syria, Democratic Republic of Congo, Turkey, Myanmar, Central and South America, and Afghanistan. Hear us, O oh God. Loving God, you make your home among us. Abide with refugees, those experiencing homelessness, those fleeing war and poverty, and all who question if there is a home in your heart. We pray for all who are sick, especially Michael, Kurt and Cindy, Julie, Laurie, Vanessa, John, Jackie, Gerhard, Brianna and Eliana, Steve and Ellie, Joanne and Frank, Judy, Sapphire, Diane, Dwayne, the Reese Ash family, Paul, Lynn Marie, Carol, Rhoda, Emily, Cheryl, Jason and family, Jean, Mike, Jamie, Ed, Gail and Richard, Deb, Mark, Aiden, Helen, Megan, Ken, Kurt, Chris, Andrew, Ella, Noreen, Alan, Jim, Jerry, Sue, Carol, Veronica, Sharon, Ann, Bruce and Karen, Judy, Lenny, Roger, Sherelle, Dennis, Jane, Bert, Carmen, Carol, Sydney, Bowen, Pat, Sue and Artie, Alan, 
Brian, Leslie, Sam, Linda, Tom, Emma, Lynn, Jim, Deborah, Ellen, Lisa, Kim, Megan, Sandy, Terry, Alex, Shannon, Susanna, Ryan, John, all of our shut-ins, the people of Shishmaref, and all Alaskan villages. Hear us, O oh God. Assuring God, you accompany your people amid uncertainty and change. Uphold people in this community who have recently moved, changed jobs or schools, retired, or are going through transitions of any kind. Lead us in your ways. Hear us, O oh God. Here, other intercessions may be offered. Renewing God, you gather the saints at your heavenly banquet. We give you thanks for the care shown us by those who have gone before us. Grant confidence and comfort for all awaiting the place that you have prepared. Hear us, O God. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praise to you, mighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. As I say, in these virtual worship services, we continue to be the church together. We continue to be connected with one another in a variety of ways. And if there are ways that we in your church family can be helpful to you, please let me know. And likewise, if there are ways that you see your gifts could be offered, through the congregation, please let me know. And now may Almighty God, who raised again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, bless you abundantly. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.